I've found that if you love life, life will love you back, Arthur Rubenstein. I'm a learner who loves to share what I've learned, and I'm thrilled that you're attending today, and I look forward to sharing a few things that I've learned in the area of Gemba Walks. I think one of the keys is respecting people. We talk a lot about continuous improvement, but very little about respecting people. Human performance is very important, and understanding that performance system will help us to do a better job. And I think creating positive changes are another key that Gamble Walks will help you unleash. So my first question is, have you ever worked with someone on a project team who had a work ethic to make an output that looks something like this? And if we were all live, there would be some laughter, I hope. You know, the Wall Street Journal points out that it only takes one bad apple to bring down the performance of an entire team. Gallup, meanwhile, reports that only 20 to 30 percent of all employees are engaged at work in the U.S. And there's a correlation between engagement and performance and business performance. So it's estimated in the U.S. 30 billion annually is lost to this situation. Imagine what it would be like to have inspired and motivated employees, customer satisfaction, and employee morale by engaging the employees better. Today I'm going to share with you a couple techniques that have helped a couple organizations go to nearly 100% engagement. Hundreds of employee suggestions being implemented, profits increasing, lunchroom conversations focusing on what improvements have been made overnight, not how lousy third shift was. But of course, any journey to organizational effectiveness is not without pain. So we have to feel the pain ourselves to understand what people go through whenever there is change. And besides experiencing change, we're going to see how appreciative and positive leadership can help grow talent. How just asking the right questions can empower and set, instill a sense of personal accountability. You'll learn how setting the stage for continuous improvement is built on every person's desire to res be respected. Their ideas count and can be implemented within the right environment through a fabulous technique we call Gimbal Walks. You know, meanwhile, we have people feeling underutilized like this, put me in coach, or hey, nobody listens to me. At the higher level of the organization, we have the senior leader, and this is a really old picture from a different day. But the question is, how approachable are our senior leaders? Management by walking around has been a long, around for a very long time, and I think it somehow ties in historically to Gamble Walks. In the book uh, written in 1982 by Tom Peters and Robert Waterman, it's called In Search of Excellence, they expouse, just get out of your office, randomly walk and interact with staff. And the idea was to build a rapport with staff. Now, Steve Jobs from Apple was an extreme management by walking around believer. He would actually call customers or email customers if they had concerns. There are some differences between management walking by walking around and gimbal walks, and I want to get to that next. First of all, Gemba is a Japanese term which means precious place, a revered place where value is created. And organizational learning occurs in the Gemba. This is a picture of a life support manufacturer that makes breathing apparatus for firemen to rescue people. So as I said before, it's about respecting people and continuous improvement. And really, that's the two pillars of the Toyota production system. We ask you to go out and see for yourself. The other thing I learned from Toyota was standing in the circle. And it's a principle where you're put in one spot for a long time and asked to find a solution or Kaizen. 
So this would be very similar. In, in healthcare, you might call it rounding. But uh, we want to look for with an eye for improvement. And there are a couple goals in a gimbal walk. And one is to demonstrate the priority seeking input by asking open-ended questions. Of course, encouraging small experiments and creating an interest in open dialogue. Really, it's that cross-boundary communication that we're after. Uh, rewarding desired behaviors and progress, making results happen visibly, and a foster a learning organization from a broader sense. So this has a nice tie into what Cotter talks about in his eight steps for uh, successful change. And it's in the references of this uh, slide deck, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. And what he talked about was create a sense of urgency, build a co uh, guiding coalition, creating a vision, communicate for buy-in, empower action, make short-term wins, and don't ever let up, and of course make change stick. And so we're going to tie this into what Cotter believes, and I'll show you how that relates. But first, why would you bother with gamble walks? You know, eliminating overtime uh, on Sundays, getting ideas implemented, imp that really matters. And of course there's financial benefits to different areas and making this a team sport is very important. Of course it ties into Kaizen and value stream mapping. Uh, it's a way to sustain those types of things. So you might ask, well how do you get started? The way we got started was just asking people to draw a map. So this is like step one. Draw a map of the area and then have a team look at different areas where you could have circles, where you could stand in a circle and observe directly. Of course you want it in a safe place where you're not going to be in the way uh, and that's very important and the other thing is observing. So a team would come out on the floor and take pictures and take notes. So the question I have for you is what do you think might happen if you just went out with a whole team of people unannounced? And I'm looking for is it would be kind of a disaster in that you know people are going to push back or they're, they're going to be afraid. And I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, Edward Stumbery Deming, you know, he said drive out fear. But I think there's still too much fear in organizations. And we'll talk about how you can how you can improve that situation. But first, let's go and look at a couple different gambas or rounding. The first one is a call center. You might ask yourself, well, what would you measure here? So you might think, okay, if I work in a call center, what's important? Obviously, people smiling on the phone is a really good sign. There are some metrics up above. And we have to be careful what metrics we measure. Sometimes we measure the shortness or the duration of the phone call and we want to get customers off the phone. And I think that's a good measure if you're not very customer focused. So it may be, maybe you want to have a different type of metrics like a sales lift. Instead of trying to get customers off the phone, stay and build a relationship with them to get them to order more. This is where my daughter goes to university and I just sent her off. So the question is, what's missing in the cafeteria? And I started looking and I was like, well, there's something missing. And it's nobody has a tray. Those plastic trays are gone. Now, plastic trays have been in cafeterias since I can ever remember. And usually they're kind of greasy, a little dirty, or they've been through the dishwasher so many times they're all warped from almost like an autoclave heat situation. And invariably, you'll see a student carrying a, a, a lot of food on a tray and they'll trip or spill or something will fall off, it'll wobble, and then when, it, when the person comes to the table, it creates a mess, untidiness, and so they eliminated the tray, eliminated all the waste associated with the tray, eliminated the need to clean the tray, and instead they put up this device that you can see on the top right which is kind of a conveyor belt with a stainless steel tray where you can put your dirty dishes and that rotates into the back area. But it's things like this that you can observe yourself 
that might lead you to new innovations that you can apply. I might ask myself, well, why would any cafeteria ever have trays anymore, given that somebody could eliminate that entire wasteful process? So we need to ask ourselves those questions when we do a Gemba walk and try to reflect and look at it from a broader sense. In this slide, I ask the question, okay, this is a metal maker, and the question is, what's wrong with this picture? And people will tell me, well, something's wrong with the scrap cart. And I'll say, yep, you're right. And they'll say, well, there's no scrap on it. And they'll say, is that a problem? And I say, yeah, it's, well, it's a good problem. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, you know, look for cases where things are going right, too. Now, this is a water spider uh, visual status. So water spider is somebody that really applies the idea and concept of treating the frontline workers like surgeons. They untangle parts, they make sure people have just what they need when they need it, and it's also a development process for that person to become a leader. They get a chance to interact with all different um, people, be able to communicate and learn how to solve problems. But a visual status shows the leaders in the area whether something's behind or on time, the red being behind. So the question I have for you as leaders, what would you do if you see this visual? Somebody, one of the two loops is behind. And the answer I'm looking for is, well, not just find out why, but drop what you're doing to help that person to get back on track. This is an airline, and it's, a, it's on an airplane and it's a switch and I took a picture of it it says the switch must be on at all times and it has an on off so I have the question why would you have such a thing on an airplane well, this is an automatic teller machine I think it's also good for yoga and then I'll ask architects and engineers what's wrong with this picture and if you look carefully you'll see there's no window in the bottom balcony but what happened when we did our first gimbal walk out in, in the Gemba, we found is that people will reflect on their, their observations and they wrote, it, wrote them down and then put them back on the map. So by putting them on the map, what we learned was that 99% were problems. So our first learning was really, and I'll ask you to write this down here, is take a piece of paper and put a line in the middle things gone wrong on the left side, things gone right on the right side, and remember to seek balance. Look for as many things gone right as you did that went wrong. Because if you've been in business, you're doing some things right. So where do a lot of organizational problems stem from? And I believe it stems from the org chart itself. And this has been around since the 1800s. The question for you is, who's missing from this picture of the organizational chart? And what I'm looking for in, in this is the customer. You know, nobody's looking at the customer in the traditional top-down organizational chart. So what we're trying to do is change the way we support the people that are closest to the customers through this concept and idea of servant leadership. An example of this is Russell Sleek, and he did a great job. He would have an amazing uh, way of being humble. And he, he would, even if he knew the answer, he, he would tell people, I don't know, what do you think? and he managed to get people engaged and was rewarded with an amazing amount of progress. Hundreds of ideas being implemented on a monthly basis and these were small things that made people's lives and jobs better. Eventually those rolled up and created a cumulative impact. But I think this is really the key is that we need to think of ourselves like Peter Nordstrom did when he was asked to create an org chart that looks like this inverted triangle here. About two weeks ago, I did a, a tour of Flextronics, and I really witnessed this no-blame environment. 
and Jimmy Exum, who's a plant manager here in Charlotte, he said, show me the ugly baby. And what he means by that is basically measure the things that will identify waste and eliminate those things. An example of that that he talked about was expediting. So why should you have expediting? And in their case, they learned it was complete waste, and they learned how to measure things that would eliminate the need for expediting. And I, obviously, the best ideas come from people close to the work. So when you do a gamble walk, you could ask, what do you think is happening, and why is that? What do you think could be done about it? What can you do about it? And what help do you need for me to, to get it accomplished? At the end of this, if you're interested, I have some tools that I can give you if you send me an email, and I'll show you my email address uh, at the end of the presentation. A um, friend of mine, uh, Kathy Mede, is quoted, and she, what she says is, you know, people aren't the soft side of business. They're the only side of business. And I really believe that's an important distinction. One of the things we want people to do is start creating hypotheses and a scientific mindset because we really want people to feel empowered to do certain things and make changes. If you're going to make changes in, in any environment, you have to allow people to do this. And what we learned was that we can't punish them if they make surprise. And this kind of goes back to that traditional mindset that you know you hear, well, don't ever surprise the boss. Well, if you don't surprise the boss, you know, will anything ever improve or will ever, anything ever change? So we have to do things not to create chaos, but to encourage a mindset of experimentation. And one of the things that we learned that we needed were some guiding principles. And I want to share those with you. At first, we learned is that if we, if we post these four awesome principles on the wall and go over them with people, they'll be more likely to open up to us. The first is we're all in this together. And a friend of mine, Lori Griebel, uh, I had just joined a new organization, and she, she was getting a ton of data for me. And I, I asked her, I said, you know, Lori, normally if I ask somebody this, to do this much favor for me, they'd push back. And she kind of looked at me and cocked her head and said, you know, we're all in this together. And it really stuck with me. The second, and I I have some people misunderstand this, um, human resource professionals sometimes don't agree with me on this. No one is doing anything wrong. What we mean is, is that you're doing the best job you can given the system of work we've created for you. Anything can be improved really opens the door for people to challenge the way things are, the status quo. So if you've been doing something for 30 years, it might, and somebody says, you know, anything can be improved, it gives you permission. And the last is we're going to help each other to improve. And what this speaks to is that the helping relationship is really what builds trust with people, according to Edgar Schein. And I believe that it ties the, all four principles together. It's about the spirit of helping and mutual respect. So let's talk a little bit more about appreciative leadership. And Drucker is quoted, you know, the organization's purpose is really aligning the strengths. You know, if we're all clones, we're all the same, then, you know, we're blindsided, we're, we're lopsided. So we have to build to our strengths. And then you know, if we only focus on problems, we'll, we'll suck the joy out of work. And I think that's one of the weaknesses to many of the approaches I've seen in continuous improvement is problems, 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 and it wears you out. So sometimes it's just by asking the right questions, we can get people to think more positively. And, you know, you could ask, what conditions bring out your best? What are you learning? What ideas do you have to make things go even better? I want to bring up uh, Richard Sheridan at Menlo Innovations in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it's very interesting about Ann Arbor. If you've never been there, it's the birthplace of the cubicle. 
and he writes cubicles kill they kill morale they kill creativity and I know a lot of us worked in cubicles or still work in cubicles but Richard brings up the point that we need to look at things from a sci scientific standpoint that a human has to use what we create and he has been very big on changing the way we look at workplaces and the goals around them so what is your goal at work if you work at Menlo Innovations with Richard Sheridan the answer is joy and in fact his book is coming out in December and it's also in the uh, the reading list that I have near the end of this he says be the empath and what's cool about Menlo is that they open their door for I think over 2,000 people visited from all over the world including Google and this is a small software company but they're after to see a radically different approach to workplace culture and Rich is quoted as saying he's removed fear and ambiguity that typically makes the workplace miserable with Joy's explicit goal of Menlo staff as well as their clients and the people who use their products they create Sheridan and his team changed everything about the, how the company was run and he talks about a shared belief system that includes a physical space embracing mistakes and eliminate meetings all while fostering dignity and respect for their team and his book is called Joy Incorporated it comes out in December and I'm looking forward to reading it I've seen Richard uh, present a couple times at ASQ's Lean Six Sigma or World Conference and he's awesome so what do you want your legacy to be look at all the transactions that I accomplished or look at all the people I developed in the legacy I left behind Mike Whitehead and Dr. David Cooperwriter did a lot of work at Case Western University in the area of appreciative inquiry and what he was talking about was that he learned is that organizations move in the directions of the questions we ask and you can find his book also in the references that I have later but I thought it was fascinating that just by asking the right question you can get people to think positively so what is it about respect for respecting people that seems matter again it's asking not telling and being humble so you might want to take a moment now and jot down you know what kind of humble question might you ask somebody A good friend of mine, uh, he's in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I missed this one. Individuals are engaged when they feel their effort and opinions are valued and rewarded for their individual contribution. So people want to be heard and they want to contribute. Now, Craig Henderson's a good friend of mine in Indiana, and he he got this funny looking little graphic to express a supervisor that one of the engineers that was working for him described and what the way Craig explained the story to me was that the engineer came to him all bummed out that the supervisor was unreasonable and Craig asked him you know well, what happened and the young person told him well you know I went over to the guy and explained how why we needed you know we need to change this and Craig kind of chuckled and said well did you did you at all appreciate what work went into getting things to run the way they were at that time in other words all the blood <laughs> injuries band-aids duct tape that was used to to put things together to get it to run the way it did so part of nobody likes bad change is we have to appreciate all the work that happened before we got there and in talking about change a lot of people will think well you know you go from point A to point B in business performance and that's change the truth of the matter is quite different and I I I have a little game or simulation that's used uh, it only takes two minutes to do and you can use it I'll describe it for you here but basically I say we're gonna do an experiment on change it takes two minutes and I'll time you for 30, 60 seconds I'll ask you to 
print your name as many times as you can in 60 seconds on a piece of paper. And so then we wait for people to get done. And then I ask, okay, how many, show of hands, how many people got five or more, and pretty much everyone raises. And, you know, we get a distribution put on the board. And I say, okay, we're going to make a small, slight little change and try again. So I tell them, switch hands. Whatever hand you first printed your name with, use your opposite hand. So if you're right-handed, use your left hand. And we do the same 60 seconds as many times as possible. And the room just breaks up in laughter and people are stressed and, you know, complaining and it's, there's a lot of groaning. It's um, pointing that changes a, is a painful process. And we all, all our humans, have to go through this valley of despair, recognizing that once you get through the despair and start asking yourself, I wonder if you can get to the other side. So when we do the change experiment, I ask people, well, how many did you get? And it's much less. And so their productivity dropped. And then I ask them, well, what happened to your quality? And of course, it dropped. And then I ask, well, what happened to your stress? And of course, it rot, it rose. So in the, in the case of change, you know, we humans have to go through a lot. And then I'll ask them, so if your hand was broken so badly it was in a cast for three months, would you eventually get better? And they go, well, sure. And that's what you want them to do is gradually climb up to get to the other side of this equation, and that's called the valley of despair. And so what we're doing here is we're combining lean thinking with organizational development, and soon we'll be talking about human performance technology. So back to change. Would this sign itself, this is a hand dryer that you would see in a typical restroom. Save trees, eliminate paper towel waste, maintain cleaner facilities with this. Or does this one do a little better job? And this is at the Illinois Toll Road, so we'll start at the top, and I guess I can use an annotation tool here. I'll use a pen, I guess. But this this looks like a paper towel dispenser. And you can see the trees being cut down here. They're being loaded on this truck, going into that mill, making this smoke out of the truck. The mill, of course, is polluting the environment. Then it goes on another truck being moved over to a manufacturer. And of course, the truck is you know, polluting on the way. The manufacturer itself is polluting probably even worse. I'm not sure what this is, if it's water, wastewater going in or whatever. But down here, you've got the truck moving again to a warehouse, and then it's being transported yet again to the Oasis. And in the Illinois toll road, that's where you stop and you get a, a break or use a restroom in this case. And then from the Oasis, you see it's going to the trash, and this is the garbage truck here, and of course there's trash coming out and pollution there, and it finally ends up in a landfill. And of course it's smoldering. <laughs> I love this. I think this is what you call root learning. So the moral is here, we like paper towels too, but uh, hand dryers are the better choice for our environment and future generations. So when you think about you're going to make a change, you're going to make any change in any organization, you know, which slide is better? You know, which which description is going to be better for you? That that sterile one I showed you on the previous slide or this one? And I don't know how to get rid of this now. Ha. Huh. Erase all drawings. Ah, there we go. And then slideshow from current. So we'll go back here. So, you know, which is a better description? So this points to people need to know the why behind change. And if you ask any parent, they'll tell you the first, first word out of their children's mouth is no. But the second word out of the child's mouth is why. And we all humans want to know the why behind change. I have a great article uh, that the Wall Street Journal wrote about that and um, be willing to share that with you as well. I want to talk about human performance because now we start to understand the situation better and this is a model that I think will really resonate with all of you. 
First is that you've got a performer in the middle and they're presented a situation. They might be given tools, they might be given a task. The performer has some skills and abilities, but they have vi vision, I mean visibility to the organization's mission. And it isn't the written vis uh, mission statement that's on the wall, it's what the leaders really express through their actions or integrity. But they're asked to do a job which, re which produces some kind of results. The question here is, are those results capable? And the really big one that we learned in studying HPT is consequences. And many times, consequences drive behaviors more than anything else. And the wrong consequences drive the wrong behavior. So we have to really be careful when we set up incentives and those types of things. Make sure that we're thinking about the right outcomes and we're thinking it through an entire system. And I've got a dotted line loop because I think many times people don't have this information, which is customer feedback. If you ask the performer, you say, well, you know, who are you making this for? You know, well, I don't know. You know, who's your customer? I don't know. Hey, when's the last time you talked to them? Uh, I got yelled at three months ago, but that's all I can remember. You know, so it's people need to have that feedback, that constant feedback to know how they're doing and improve the performance. I know this is a lot, but I think this is very key to all of us understanding better when we go into the Gemba and do our Gemba walks, what's really important and what we should really look for uh, when we talk to people, when we observe. We should look for these types of things. Uh, they would fit very well in an Ishikawa or fishbone diagram as well. So I have a question. Let's apply this human performance system or model to an actual picture of a Gemba. About a month ago, a month or two ago, I was in a hardware store and I saw this and I had to get a picture of it. What's happening here is, is that I believe this is a pressure washer. So it's a mechanical device. I may be mistaken. So whatever it is, it's being assembled by the worker with the t-shirt on the left and the person to the right I'm assuming is a customer. And the, the product was probably promised to have a free assembly and they may have been out of assembled ones and had to pull one out of a box. So going back to this model here for a quick second, what's really missing? And what I'm looking for is, I'm really looking for, you know, the right work set, set up. I mean, why isn't the height of this right? Why doesn't the person have the tools in the right place? Uh, bending over like this is going to be really hard on the person's back. And I'm surprised that a large uh, nationwide store would have such a, uh, such a, a work system. So... Anyway, so you're the pilot. How are things running? You know, and this goes back to visual controls. And what would you change? So the old racer's trick is to put the dial indicator where the normal condition would be straight up or the shift point, maybe a tachometer on a motorcycle if you're racing it. So for an airplane, if you could make all the dials go up, and that would show the normal situation that would be much better for you. I think I basically covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover with you today. Uh, some for additional resources on this Gimbal Walks for Service Excellence. That book, we look at the, the Kano model to look for innovators. So what's going to be the new uh, delighters that you can create for your customers? So if you're in the healthcare industry, what your customers want in terms of service, but also what might delight them. A friend of mine, Joe Dager, runs a, a very nice blog and does a lot of podcasts at Business 901. Uh, Creating a Lean Culture has a pretty good chapter on Gimbal Walks, uh, David Mann. The Heart of Change, we talked about that, uh, the eight-step process that Cotter brings, and I think how Gimbal Walks can be used uh, to support that. Leadership and New Science is uh, Meg Wheatley's book. Uh, she's fabulous. I love this stuff. 
appreciative inquiry I already mentioned from Dr. David Cooperider and then if you want to get into performance improvement in human performance technology, Dr. Judith Hale's work is fabulous. And the book that I mentioned before about mental innovation from Richard Sheridan is due out on December 26th this year. And you can pre-order it on Amazon. I think I got signed up for the Kindle version. Ultimately, what we, what we choose to pay attention to matters most. And I have the tools that I can give you later that shows you step by step how you go about doing a gimbal walk and what you can uh, do as a leader as well as what you need to do uh, to get started. And, and there's some standard work in there as well, um, which basically helps you systematize it. Always re show respect and get the first-hand data. You're looking for, you know, rewarding the behaviors you know, and asking questions. And asking better questions is really going to, I think, really make a, make a huge difference. Because if we're all after the same thing. And I am, uh, I, I have several things that I do. And I, I'm currently self-employed, so... I help companies with business transformation programs, turnkey, train the trainer, um, complete front to back uh, from needs analysis to full implementation. Uh, I do training of, of the soft skills for internal change agents. Um, of course, value stream map and improvement facilitations, Kaizen events or rapid improvements. Uh, these areas are very important and very good. Value Stream is focusing on strategic, and Kaizen is more tactical. Um, and of course, getting buy-in and leading without authority. And I do keynote speeches as well. And that's basically uh, what I had for you today. And here's where to contact me. Um, my name is Bob Petruska, and you can send me an email at bob at bobpetruska.com. If you want the tools, just put tools in the uh, subject line of your email and then if you want if you think you know you want me to call you and talk about some of these things that I specialize in put call in there uh, of course you're welcome to join me on LinkedIn I would love it if you guys reached out to me and and connected with me on LinkedIn um, and if you are interested in my book and want to learn more about that you can do that as well and I'll go ahead and put a chat in here for at um, bob at bobpatriska.com. Okay, Bob, thank you very much. Um, what a wonderful session. I learned a lot, and I know that everybody else learned a lot. We had um, one question, and I just wanted to make sure and clarify. Um, copies of the slides, are participants able to get those from you if they email you also? Uh, yeah, I'll be glad to give them that. So okay. just ask me. All right. And for those of you that joined after we started in the logistics portion of it, the webinar is recorded and will be available on the Lean Enterprise Division website. So you will be have access to that. It'll be under the library section on the left hand side of the web page. Other than that, I think we are all set for the day. We do have a couple of questions um, that... Yeah, let's do those. Uh, yes, and I think you can see if you will, Bob, on yours, if you will uncheck the show answered questions, you'll be able to see those that I haven't already addressed. So, okay, I'm looking at the questions right now, and it looks like... Um, uh, we have a question. Oh, the correction. Thank you for the correction on the... W. Edward Stemming. So thank you for that. I see that as said, change is the only constant in the world in a sense that everything's changing nevertheless. Nobody likes to change. Okay, thank you. How do you how you make sure that showing respect is not understood by others a weak point? How do you make sure that showing respect is not understood? Uh, 
So I might be reading into that that the question in there is how do you help other people understand that respect really is important um, or showing respect is, is really important, which is a weak point in a lot of organizations. Yeah. Mohammed, if I did not get that right, throw us another <laughs> question, but that's my interpretation. <laughs> All right. So, you know, okay. That that's a good question. I I don't know. You know, you have to you have to try your best to to express the importance of respecting for people. If if people don't get it, I mean, if if you're if you're having that as a weak spot, um, I think it, it would be pointing out the consequences of it. And and one way you could do that is is to we, we use a tool uh, for feedback and we can ask for let's say for example 360 feedback you could ask that leader to you know okay so want to get feedback um, and that would be you know private confidential feedback uh, that's given to them and and then they can see that um, as far as the importance of it goes uh, you know it's critical and and I think it's just really up to us as change leaders to help people around us understand the importance of respecting people. And and I think you'll see it in the performance when people get it. It's like, well, that leader over there is doing a lot of good things. Well, why is that? So that that might be way one way to do it is to show and demonstrate. You know, ask the question. Well, you know, there's a leader over here. It seems to be doing fairly well. Do, can you can you you know? highlight some of the differences there. It's a touchy thing, it's difficult because when you're dealing with a person that doesn't get it, you have to work slowly. So it takes time and I'd be glad to talk to you offline, Mohammed, on that. Can you please elaborate on how important is change management in the change process? Right, change management is is very important and really the key on that is going to be around communication and it's the why behind the change that seems to matter the most and again uh, if you're interested and you want to have that resource on the article I use the article as a way to explain the importance of it but also there's some questions that I ask people and debrief after they've read it it's like a one-page Wall Street Journal article okay I think respect needs to be defined first people are always taking for granted that everyone knows what respect is about. <laughs> right. Respecting a person means respecting them as a whole person. Um, so define respect is, is that we're going to listen to each other, we're going to understand, seek seek first, you know, Covey says seek first to understand, begin with the end in mind, but seek first to understand. We have two ears and one mouth, so respect is about listening first and and listening not only to what's said but what's not said the the nonverbals so it's and, and it's about building a rapport with that person and i think really the key of this is all about that helping relationship in your experience a walk is best performed by a group or individual right um, a a group is is better and the reason for this is that one thing that we we've, we've done before is we'll put the We'll put the circles out there and we'll have people spend, let's say, 10 minutes in one circle and rotate with a partner uh, in, in another circle. And there might be 10 circles out there with five people. Okay, 10 circles, 10 people, but they all switch and, they, and so each person gets a chance to reflect from the same vantage point with another partner. And what you find is that there's a lot of differences that people pick up and it's like, well, I saw that, but you didn't. And and really, you want the gamble walk being led by the senior most leaders. I mean, ideally, you've got like Jimmy Axum, the plant leader. What he does, he he does it every Friday with the sole leadership team, and they look for uh, the successes that has happened, as well as the things that are you know people are are constrained with, and and makes it fun. So let's see, should gamble walks focus on how people do the process instead of what's the condition of our tools? Well, I think we the the how of the process is is very important, especially when you talk about standardized work. Um, the condition of the tools is very important as well. 
So I, I don't know if there's a, a better way to do it, um, how people do the process instead of what's a condition or tools, right? Well, I would agree with you. I, th I think how they do the process is very important. And I think also learning from each other. So if a lot of times people will do things slightly different. And, and it's about sharing those best practices as well. This is in our gimbal walk. We mainly focus on the condition of our company asset. Okay, to comment. Hey, um, Bob, there's a question from Ken up top. I think maybe scrolled off your screen. He um, is asking about the trays in your ca in the cafeteria slide you had. His mm. first reaction, and I have to admit, Ken, that was my first question: is how are these people carrying their plates and their drinks and napkins? How does that work there? <laughs> right, and and so the the you know I went through that with my daughter and my wife too when we dropped her off and. And, you know, you just carry what you can. And you might have to take a separate trip to get a drink. So it gets you up and moving around. You only can carry what you can carry. Obviously, you don't want to try to just load up. The other thing, too, is that um, I think you don't, you don't get too much food either. Because this is cafeteria. I think, you know, they, the, the students have one payment that they make. And they can get whatever they'd like. So maybe it also reduces the waste too because they don't they don't bring more than what they can really eat. But that was, a, that was interesting. What is more important, change enabling or change management? Well, I think enabling change, enabling the conditions for change. You know, management after the change is sort of like, well, I'm saying is that we're going to go from here to there, and and you know, so enabling I think is more important. Thanks. How people do the work. Do you include frontline from other areas within a manufacturing facility? Of course. Of course you do. Do you have any recommendations how to conduct a gamble walk at an office process when everyone is pretty much in the computers? Right. Well, that's great. Uh, what we do there is we will we'll actually uh, go through and ask them to show us what you do and understand it. A lot of times, we'll have them map it out and the, by mapping it, there's a couple tools we use to map it. Uh, we can see what's going on and we can make drastic improvements from that. So the key is, is, is you can still use some of the visual tools, some of the manual tools uh, to set up office cells and standing cells and that kind of thing. Uh, we've done this in repetitive process areas like accounts payable, accounts receivable, Accounting is, is very conducive to setting up these types of cells as well. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I've got a, a graphic on that. And I don't know, am I getting these questions right, Chris? Yes. I, I mean, yes, it's really hard are. for me to see these. Yeah, you've got two, two left. Hopefully you can see them. Um, the next one from John is asking about if you've ever used customers in your Gamba Walks. Oh yeah. He ponders. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. For sure we have. And and it's very it's very telling when a customer comes in and joins you in a in a gamble walk. Uh, because then they get to see firsthand uh, what you're doing, what you're working on. So yeah, highly recommended uh, to to do that. It's it's actually a good way to show the progress that you're making and it respects the people in that you know, the idea, and going back to respect for people, I think one of the things that we struggle with is that who gets credit for the idea? And I want the credit to go to the person that, that's closest to the operation. Even though I might have had something to do with it, I'd much rather them have the credit for it because they're going to have the buy-in and the ownership of it to carry it forward and sustain it. So even if there's an idea that you might come up with yourself, you want to give that credit away freely. And that's about respecting people. And so when a customer comes in, doing a gamble walk to allow the frontline workers to see uh, that operation is great. I've also brought frontline workers into customers' operations to do a gamble walk with the customer. And then they will come back and share the stories of why it's important to get things right, how we can improve our quality even more. And then you've got an advocate working on your behalf, and that's fabulous. 
Okay, Chris, help me out here. Okay. Um, we now have a question, well, a comment, a question, sorry, from Francisco from Chile. How many times, um, or how, oh, how much time does it take to implement this methodology? Well, it, it, it can be done very quickly. Um, you know, at, at the first company we used this at, which was in 2004, uh, an operations manager and myself just started doing a daily walk. And, and so you had the quality manager and the operations manager just, just impromptu at around the shift change. We had two shifts, so we caught in the afternoon, and we would just walk through one end to the other. And we would stop along the way looking at different things. And just by standing there and observing it, it attracted attention of the people around us. They were like, well, what are you guys working on? And so people would come over and say, well, what are you guys working on? Well, we're trying to understand this. Can you help us understand? And then the answer would be, no, I don't understand it either. Why these, there would be work in process or something building up or whatever. And <clears throat> what eventually happened was the people from the supplying areas started being curious why we're standing in front of a big par uh, wall of parts. And they would, you know, somebody would just say, well, I know exactly why that is. And oh, by the way, I know how to I know how to solve it, and you know, here's what I can do to fix it. I mean, it, you know, we were both on the floor when that happened. It was amazing. Eventually, we got to the point where we were we were just opening it up, and anybody could come with us, and the whole place would shut down, and we had all everybody was in the gamble walks, and so we realized that wasn't going to be sustainable for long. So we started you know, rotating people in and we would rotate them based on, on their desire to make improvements and be selective about who was allowed to be, you know, part of that, that gamble walk. So it really doesn't take that much time to get started. It's just you have to, you can't do it yourself. You have to bring somebody else, a cross-functional team member, and then or you can sell it to the to the leadership and say, well, you know, we need to do this and, and here's how we would go about doing it. Um, it might take, in a, in a larger organization, it might take more time. It depends also on the size of the organization and whether or not you can get that senior most leader on board. Because if you can get the senior most leader on board, like Jimmy Exum at Flextronics, it's a done deal. I mean, it's, you know, it's going to happen. He's going to make sure it happens every week on Friday. Perfect. So there's a question from... Let's see, what's the next one, Chris? Is Ro it is a guide for Rosa from Mexico, or I think Rosie wants to know, do you have a guide or is there a tool for taking notes during the standing in circles? Right. I have the tools I can, I can give you, um, and, and I'll, I'll give you that. And then, you know, you definitely do want to take the observation. So um, the standard work that I have is, is I'll show you. It's so pretty pretty easy to look at uh, current slide. You know, just basically what you do here, standing in there, and then for leadership, you know, this is the kind of thing that I I'm very interested in doing is you know cr major steps, key points. You know, just like standard work would be. Mm -hmm. So hope that helps that. And then what was the other one? The next one. Okay, um, well, we've got a couple of minutes left and we've got a couple of questions, so this is going to be perfect. Good. Uh, Gerardo actually just has a comment, um, a very good one. He says, you know, our associates really need to know that they are our customer as well. So I think uh, he's commenting to that internal customer concept that we all know is so important. And then. Yeah. And that goes back to the human performance model I showed you before, Gerardo, um, about that. So it's, you know, it's very clear that, you know, there needs to be an unbroken chain and people need to understand what that is and work on that. Thank you. Okay. And last but not least, James. Um, oh, we got another one. Uh, last but, uh, James asks, who in the organization typically does a gimba walk? And I think you kind of touched on that, but maybe a quick answer um, from your experience. My, my preference is that, it, is that it's the senior leader team that does a gimba walk. Um, and, and you can fr lead from the back. I mean, I encourage you as a change agent to to encourage those kinds of things. You can do it, you know, kind of a skunk works project, but preferably you've got the senior leader and, and it takes a lot to sell and I'll be willing to, 
to help you with the selling of it. If you contact me, you've got my email address, uh, and you can get the slides. So, you know, please just reach out to me. And there's other ones here. Uh, yes, a lot more. Uh, Joseph. Yeah. Going back to the earlier question about respect, in some cul corporate cultures, being respectful is mistaken for being weak. Very true. How do you counteract that problem when you have those? <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing myself. I want <laughs> I want to change the culture. I mean, okay, I, all right, all right, all right. Um, we, I think respect is something that's that's all humans deserve. So. Um, that culture that you know that sees that as a weakness, I guess it's just a matter of of just working with them to help them understand that you know they may not be right. Uh, humility is very important, and and I'd much rather a leader. And I've been in I've worked in those situations too where a leader would just talk louder, you know, instead of listening you know if they don't know the answer they just scream at you louder and that environment is really tough to change without changing the leadership but if it's an entire culture like uh, the way um, people behave in and maybe in a in a different society uh, than I'm accustomed to then then that is something that you're gonna have to really work on and and just slowly I would suggest slowly baby steps with that one because that's cultural and you've got to work around that now, that's a tough one thank you Chris okay and last but not least um, I keep thinking it's last but not least how do we follow up on the gimbal walks <laughs> right the, the follow-up on the gimbal walks can be done and I, I love the newsletters uh, I love to take pictures and I, I do this quite a bit myself, uh, and I'll sh you know I can show you tons of them. You know if you if you ask me if you want to talk to me after this, I'll love to talk to you. But creating a newsletter and and st um, telling the story, documenting that is very important. And I think a, a keeping an action log of different things is also important as well. Is it? For example, you know what improvements are being planned. How are they going? What's the status? Some companies will use the A3 and they'll actually post the status uh, using a visual board, and they'll put a green on there if it's if if that A3 is being implemented correct, you know, on time and on budget and all. And they'll put a red on there with stickies that, and the and the red indicates that it's behind, and that leader. Uh, who's responsible for that A3 has to have an explanation or a corrective action plan for how they can get it on, on track. But there's num numerous ways you can follow up. Um, and then if somebody gets it right, I think the main thing is highlight their accomplishments, reward them on the spot with the plant you know, leadership as being a reward and never a punishment. Great. Other questions? No, nope, I think that is it for questions. I really appreciate that everybody was asking questions. Um, that tells me just what I knew going into this. Bob is a wonderful presenter, has great information, and um, everybody stayed very engaged. So thank you very much to everybody that was on the call. A um, couple of quick things here. Uh, just a reminder that November's webinar, Justin Rolfe, he's going to be talking to us about re-engineering sales um, and using lean principles to create processes and such. If you want to reach Bob, more questions. He's um, Bob, you want to throw up that last slide with your email address just one more time for folks. Um, you know how to reach him. He's got great stuff. He can help you in your organization if you need him to or just help you with some information. We've got a couple of uh, um, great job um, comments from some folks. Um, and a couple of other questions that we didn't get to. So what we will do really? for those of you that have other questions and they're in the box and we didn't get to them, I will have Bob email you the answers to those. Thank you all for your participation and we will see you next month.